Hey, thank you so much for checking out today's video. I'm Pastor Matt, this is Pastor Adrian, and we pray this message blesses you and encourages you all throughout your week. Absolutely. For any more information on how to be praying with us or to become a part of our community or to give, please head on over to takeovergr.com. All right, good evening. Um, man. Um, I mean, the Lord's just doing, he's messing me up tonight. He's been messing me up for the last few days um, with, this, with his word. Um, and then coming in and having Zach... Um, Man, he's moving. Um, him coming in with with the exact same posture and and in the same vein of what I'm I'm preaching on tonight. Um, man, he's just doing something, and I'm excited. I'm excited because it's uh, I just feel like it's it's whatever he's trying to do here. Um, it's just a reverence that he's laid on me for what Zach was talking about, like be, being low, realizing our need for him. Um, yeah, and just having the revelation that, like, you know, maybe I'm not as good as I think I am. Maybe we aren't as good as we think we are. That that there is a need for the Savior at all times. Um Man, okay, so I'm just going to go ahead and get into it. Um, so I titled this sermon, um, I guess pretty fittingly now, Tears and Ointment. Um, coming out of Luke 7, um, verse 36 through 50. Starting in verse 36. One of the Pharisees asked him, being Jesus, to eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at table. And behold, a woman, a woman of the city who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment and standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee, who had invited him, saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, Say it, teacher. A certain money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debts of both. Now which of them will love him more? And Simon answered, The one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, You have judged rightly. And then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. And he said to her, Your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at the table with him began to say amongst themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Oh, we're just going to pray, and then uh, we're going to keep going here. Father God, I just pray that tonight would just be only about what you're trying to tell us, Lord. Um. God, that there would be no distractions, that there would be nothing that comes out of my mouth that is not exactly what you want me to say, Lord. Um, 
Father, that you would just be here with us and that you would just move in, in what you're trying to teach us here tonight. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> um, yeah, so we're just going to go right into it. Um, you can, like I said, I'm getting messed up. Probably tell, like, there's, I just have, like, this, uh, this weight on me. Um, and if you've heard me preach before, I tend to use a lot of, like, stories or, like, you know, life experiences, my childhood, my family, that kind of stuff. Um, that has been my style a lot of like a storyteller kind of thing, trying to relate to scripture. Um, but like I said, tonight I'm like, I just feel very burdened that like there shouldn't be anything that I say that is not exactly to the point of what he's trying to say. Um, so yeah, that's all I want tonight is just to articulate this well, like what the Lord is trying to say. Um, yeah, without delay, without taking the focus off of, of the woman and Jesus and, and everything. So yeah, man. Um, tears and ointment. This, uh, this unnamed woman who simply in this passage is listed as a woman of the city. She's a sinner. Um, she's at the center of the story with Jesus. And based off of correlating scriptures from the Gospel of John, um, we can match up that this is uh, Mary Magdalene, okay? Um, who prior to this, her, her first encounter with Jesus um, was actually her having demons cast out of her. Um, I'm not sure if anybody has seen like the Chosen series. Um, they do a really good um, depiction of her being oppressed and tormented by demons. Um, and they, they even show like, Nicodemus, the high priest, like comes in. He's told that there's this woman that has these demons, and he can't get them out because they're so powerful, and he's terrified. Um, and then Jesus later comes and is able to cast out those demons. Um, kind of besides the point, but if you get a chance to watch it, it's cool. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but that that's just an example of like, kind of shows really well who she was and, and how they first kind of interacted and how, how that first encounter with them. So this woman, Mary, she has her life radically changed by this encounter with Jesus. Okay, she's gone from being an outcast that people would steer clear of because of her being physically and mentally tormented by demons. Okay, um, not many people want to hang around when that's going on. So She's gone from that to being set free from all this torment. All of a sudden, she's, she's normal again. You know, she's back to her, her previous self, okay? Um, she's been made well. She's no longer suffering constantly. And one of the things that I was thinking about as I was going through all of this, this preparation is that, you know, I, I, I can't truly grasp what that's like. Um, I don't think many of us would be able to apart from a few, like, you know, very rare situations. Um, but the one thing that I, I was thinking of was, like, what we've all experienced is, like, physical pain in our lives. Like, that's just, like, a very human, human element, okay? Like, everybody has experienced physical pain at some point. Um, and for most of us, it is something that's temporary that goes away. Um, you know, there are obviously cases of people who have, like, chronic illnesses and pains that don't go away until Jesus gets his healing hands on them and they're finally healed. Um, but there are cases like that where that happens. But most of us would not know what that feels like, to have like a chronic pain that never, never goes away. Um, so I was just thinking like, man, if, if you can think of a time in your life when you've been in pain, and, I, and I'm not talking like, I mean, you can think of, like, the worst pain you've, you've felt. You can think of, like, something minor, whatever you think of. But just think of that thing that is a nagging pain, but it doesn't go away, okay? Like, it flares up in the middle of the night. It hits you while you're at work. You're eating, whatever it is. Like, it's always constantly there, okay? And then think of 
the sweet relief that you would experience once that pain finally ended, right? Like that is just there all the time and then it's finally gone. Okay, even something as simple as, as a headache, you know, like most people have had some type of headache where there's, there's pressure built up in your head. Um, man, think about like the sense of relief when a headache finally goes away, you know? Like you can finally sh- see straight, you can get back to just living normal. Um, you know, nothing's blurry, it's all, everything's great, right? But then, so, so think about this. Think about you have that headache and it lasts for, it's, if at first it's a week and then it's a month and then it's two months and then it's a year and it doesn't go away, okay? But then on top of that, you, you've had voices and thoughts and actions that are not your own but you're, you're doing them because you're oppressed by this demonic presence. That, that's what she's going through. She's in pain. She's being tormented. She's doing things that she doesn't want to do because she is being oppressed and controlled by these spirits. These, and there's seven of them. There's seven demons that are consistently attacking her. Okay? And like I said, in, that, in the, the episode of The Chosen where they show it, like there have been priests that have come in and tried to help you but nothing helps. Like they, they take off and run because they're scared of you. And the, all that you want is help, but you just continue to fight them off. Dude, that is like, as I was thinking about it, I was like, man, that would be like the most hopeless feeling in the entire world. Like there's nothing that you, you can possibly do that's going to get you out of that situation. Until one day a man meets you randomly who isn't a priest, who isn't dressed in a fancy robe or carrying some, you know, like relic that he has, the swinging some, you know, thing with whatever smoke or oil, whatever in it, like none of that stuff, okay? But he shows up and he simply tells the demons to leave and you to be healed and, and it happens immediately. <laughs> like, Dude, the, the relief that would just flood your body of like, holy crap, like this just happened. Like, I'm finally free of this, this pos- oppression, this, this, these demons that were just like smothering me forever. I'm finally free. And I had this thought of like, man, like what, what would you do in that situation? Because I would hope that my reaction would be the same as, as Mary's where it's like, I just need to follow this guy. Like, there's, no, there's nothing I can possibly do, like, other than to be like, I need to be with this dude. Like, he just completely changed my entire life and freed me. So the only, only response can be to just, like, go wherever he's going because this dude is insane. Like, this just happened. This is crazy. So she follows him, okay, and she knows that she needs to be with this man, all right? She, she might not know who he is yet. She really probably has no clue what is going on. But all she knows is that she was being tortured for probably what felt like forever, and now she's not, and it's because of this dude. So she's going to go with him. So... This night, this evening, she finds out that he is going to be having dinner at this Pharisee's house. And she decides that she's going to go, right? Like, she's like, okay, well, obviously, I need to go, like, see this guy. And she doesn't just go to find him. She comes bearing a, a gift as well, all right? When, when I was younger, like, when I had read this story before, um, or, like, heard this story my, my first, like, initial thought was, like, that this was just, like, taking place at her house and that she was, like, oh, I just have this oil that is, like, here. I might as well just use it because he's, like, a guest. You know what I mean? Dude, no, that is not the case at all. She brings this from her own home, all right? She decides that she's going to find him. She, go, she goes and gets this ointment in this alabaster jar from her own home and brings it with her because she's not going to show up empty-handed. She brings it with her 
And it is her most valuable possession that she has. And she's intentionally bringing it to him for him alone, this specific purpose. Because this jar of ointment, it's, it's, it's listed as like this nard. It's like a perfume that is crazy, highly expensive, all right? Um, but it's like her most valuable possession, all right? This wasn't just like a perfume that you get off the, the, the shelf at a store, like hit up Sephora and get something. No, that's not this, all right? Yes, I have a wife and a daughter. I know what Sephora is. Um, <laughs> But it's not that. It's not just like a department store, like you're going to get a, you're reloading your perfume for 30 bucks, okay? This, this ointment, this perfume is worth 500 denarii. Okay, any guesses as to like how much that is today by non-pastors that have studied it? <laughs> Anybody? Whoa, you're off by a little bit. I'll tell you. Um, it, at that time, that would have been 20 months worth of wages for the average person. 20 months. So, as my mind likes to work, okay, I know that everything is, is very different today in terms of money and the way that it works and, and everything is a lot different. I understand that, okay? But just for the sake of an argument here, okay, I did the, the math, all right? Based on our average income in our state, that would be $83,000, okay? You can subtract tax if you want to, all right? But that's what average 20 months worth of wages for us today would look like, all right? $83,000, um, which I know sounds expensive. Again, everything is different. I understand that. But that's just the value, kind of the correlation here, okay? Just so we're all on the same page as to what she's doing. Um, not sure how much y'all have saved up, but I'll give you another stat. The average in the United States is about $8,000, okay, of savings. So I know that something valued at $83,000 is not something to turn your nose up at, all right? Um, that's a Maserati, in case you're wondering. Or maybe even maybe it's a low end, but that's a Maserati, okay? Used Maserati, maybe. <clears throat> you get the idea. But that is, in this time period, without a doubt, her most valuable possession, the thing that she has that is of the most value in her life. And her reaction to Jesus is that she needs to see him and she needs to give this to him. She needs to give him everything of value that she has. Man, I told y'all this was, this was breaking me. <sighs> Man, it might be the only thing of value that she has left after what she's been through. Like if you think about where she's at, it might be the last thing of value that she like managed to like bury or like hang on to through everything that's happened with her with these demons. But she goes home to get it, to meet him here, because she heard he's going to be there, and she's not going to miss the chance to be with him. So she shows up to this house, and it doesn't even say that she was necessarily invited. Okay, this is a Pharisee's house, and she's a woman that is clearly listed as a sinner, all right? She's been tormented by demons. So I don't think that she was uh, getting party invites that often. But she shows up anyways. And she's not interested in what's for dinner. She's not coming for part of the pot roast or whatever they're having. She is there for one purpose, and that is just to lay at the feet of Jesus. To lay at the feet of the man that set her free. And again, we don't even know if she fully understands yet who he is, or like what's going on, but she goes anyways. And she just lays at his feet and weeps. And she's so overcome with the magnitude of Jesus and, and her healing, the freedom that he's gifted her with, that she just weeps. And she uses the tears that she is crying to wash his feet. Now, 
we've already established that I can get up here and I can cry with the best of them. All right, like that, that is what it is. Not shy about it. When the Lord is moving, like I can't help but be moved by it. But I was thinking about this scene taking place and how many tears she must have shed. Like how intense that weeping must have been to be able to use that to wash his feet. Like, you know, like everybody's had their feet dirty at some point where it's like, man, I got to wash my feet or whatever. Like it takes a decent amount of water and like scrubbing your feet to get dirt off. And she had the, enough tears to use that instead of water to wipe the dirt off of his feet. <clears throat> That's a lot of tears. That is just such, like, man, that image to me, like, like dude, I told y'all, it's been messing me up. The image of her just laying there, like, dude, you know how hard somebody has to be crying to cry that many tears? <sighs> and she uses her hair like a towel to wipe the tears and the dirt from his feet. One of the biggest beauty symbols that humans have one of the biggest symbols of expression that humans have. Her hair. She, she just disregards it. Doesn't matter. Because she needs something to wipe his feet clean. Man, I've, I've always found that fascinating. That she is willing to use her hair like, man, doesn't matter how dirty I get. Nothing else matters except that I am gonna, just going to sit here and I'm going to clean his feet. And as I, was, as I was going over this again last night, just like reading it again and praying, I just had this, this like recurring thought of like, when have I served him like that? When have I given to him of myself like that? Like... Man, thanks, dude. Sorry, guys. I'm really, I really was trying not to get up here and be a mess after what I've been going through. Um, at least until I was done up here, I was trying not to. But that's what she's doing. And then on top of that, then she's she's pouring out this ointment, this expensive ointment out of this expensive jar on his feet and she's anointing his feet and she just honors him she's just kissing his feet and honoring him and as Jesus later says to the Pharisee in this home where he came to eat and he was not given the customary treatment this woman is honoring him See, the, the, the custom at that time is that, like, when a guest came to your house to eat, you know, he, he should have been offered water to, to clean his feet after walking around in, in, on the dusty roads in sandals all day. He should have been given, like, greeted with a, a, a kiss, like, to, to, like a gesture of kindness, and should have been given, like, a, an oil, like a fragrance to, like, anoint him as he came in. But he's not given any of these things. Because the Pharisees don't have any type of respect for him. Because they, they view him as, as blasphemous and the guy that's starting problems. So this guy invited him to his home for a meal. But he's not giving him the customary treatment that you would expect to give anybody else that walks through that door. But they haven't experienced what Mary has experienced with Jesus. So she is the one that does all of these things. This woman who 
the other people are scoffing at the table because she's making a scene, clearly. She's sobbing and kissing his feet. And they're just like silently judging her. But she is the one that recognizes that the only thing that is needed in this moment is to be at his feet. The other people there, they don't understand. They don't get what she's doing or the magnitude of of, of this moment with her and Jesus. Even to the point where the, the Pharisee that invited Jesus to his home, Simon, he's having an internal dialogue about how she's a sinner and Jesus shouldn't even be letting, letting her touch him. If, if Jesus was actually a prophet, how would he let this woman even near him? Like, that's crazy to this guy. And this is where I, I think that Jesus, like, sometimes just loves to mess with people because he's like, this guy is having this, like, internal, like, saying it to himself, not really speaking it out loud. And Jesus answers his thought out loud with a question back to him. Like in verse 39, he says, it says here, Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she's a sinner. And Jesus answered, Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, Say it, teacher. A certain money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now which one of them loved him more? And then Simon gives his answer. But can you imagine what is going on inside of Simon in this moment? Like, he's criticizing Jesus inside his own head for letting this woman touch him. And Jesus comes back with a question for him that with Simon being a Pharisee and presumably a a scholar and like somebody who's pretty smart at the time, he would understand that he's answering his internal thought with this question. He shows Simon that he is in fact a prophet and who he claims to be. And then when he continues... um, like I mentioned earlier, he continues with, with telling Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with oil. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. And that's that's where for me, man, I was having this wrestling back and forth of like the Lord just breaking me as my need for him. And like, man, I can think that I'm doing a lot of things great. But if I have that same mindset as, as Simon where it's like, man, I'm, I'm off. I'm just, I'm missing the mark. I can do a lot of things great, but if I have the same mindset as Simon, I'm off. Because he says straight up, right, right to Simon's face, Jesus is saying, that he doesn't understand the magnitude of Jesus' presence like Mary does. He's just telling him, like, dude, you're a righteous, religious man who doesn't understand the weight of your own sin. That's where, like, dude, do I understand the magnitude of the sin that I've been forgiven of? Because Simon is sitting there, he's casting judgment on this woman as a sinner, because she's broken more of the laws than he has. Well, he's not grasping that all sin, any sin has separated him from God. It's all, it is all separated him. 
And Mary gets it because she can see through it all. She sees Jesus is a sa- the Savior that she needs because he's done it for her physically. He's, he's cast the demons off of her. She sees that he is the gateway to the Father in heaven. But Simon, feeling as though his sins are few and far between, he isn't as in need of saving. Like, that's kind of how he's, like, propped up as a Pharisee. Like, he, he has this mindset of, like, I'm a religious man. I'm in charge of all these people. I, I uphold the law. I, I'm, I'm in a, a position of high stature. I'm good. Like, I'm the one that runs this. Like, who, who are you? Like, I'm the one that should be judging this woman, not realizing that he himself is still just as guilty. So that's when Jesus says, but he who is forgiven little loves little. Man, he who is forgiven little loves little. Man, worship team, you guys can probably make your way back up here. Um, but Mary, Mary gets that though. Mary understands the, the who is forgiven little loves little, who is forgiven much loves much because she has been forgiven of, of everything. He has broken the chains off her. She gets it. She understands the weight of her sin. She understands that the only thing that is needed at this time is to be at the feet of Jesus. I mean, we, we sing the song up here all the time, there is only one thing that's needed. This is the one thing that's needed. That's what he's just been laying on my heart. Is like, this is the one thing that's needed. This is the most important thing to him. Dude, I'm, I'm sure that that meal was delicious and it took a long time to prepare. I'm sure it cost a lot of money, a lot of work went into it. But Jesus was so much more concerned with what Mary was doing to honor him than the actual meal that was in front of him. Like she she was behind him. The meal is in front of him and he's more concerned with what she is doing back here honoring him than he is with the people at the table and, and the meal that's in front of him. He is so moved by her actions that in the telling of this story in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus says, Truly I say to you, wherever this Gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Dude, what an absolute honor. The honor of a lifetime and the honor of eternity to be mentioned by Jesus in the gospel that's about him. Saying, whenever this story of me is told, she will be recognized as having done what is the correct thing. Man, the honor of eternity. And again, this was a very like introspective preparation for me. Um, but I was asking myself, like, have I even come close to that? That's what was like, it was, that was probably the biggest thing that was messing me up during this prep. Like, there's a lot of things. But have I even come close one time? Man, have I scratched the surface of the possibility of Jesus seeing my sacrifice that way? Because I've had moments with the Lord that have messed me up. I've had moments where He's been here in this room. I've, I've left with my jaw just dropped to the floor because of the things that He's done, the things that we've witnessed in this place just in disbelief because he's blown my mind so many times. But have I ever, have we as a church ever brought a sacrifice to him 
as worthy as the one that Mary brought in the form of her tears and her ointment. Because I, I want to be the one who Jesus looks at and says, man, now that, that is, is proper worship of me. I want him to look at us and just say like, man, this, this is the one thing that matters. Like they, they are doing the one thing that matters. Like it's great that you set the table for a meal, but you're doing the one thing that matters, the one thing that I care about the most. I want to have that heart posture of Mary, like just feeling the weight of what he has saved me from. And knowing that the only correct response is to weep at his feet and just pour out everything that I possibly could have a value on him. Because her sins, which are many, are forgiven for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. Man, I just think it's so easy to think like I'm, I'm a Christian. I go to church. I'm a good person. I do the thing. And just like rest on that. And like I'm good because of that. If you have had this thought, please do not leave here tonight with this thought in your head, please. It's just been weighing on my heart that, that we need to be in constant, repeating state of understanding how much we have been forgiven and therefore how much we should pour out our love on him as the only proper response to that forgiveness that he's bestowed upon us. I mean, Matt, Matt has said, I think even a couple times recently, when he's, he's talking about like giants of the faith and scripture, he's saying like, what did this person know that we don't know? What did they understand that we don't understand? And that was messing me up too. Like, man, what did Mary know that I don't know? What did she understand that we have not yet understood? Because I want to understand it. Like, I want to know. I want to understand how much, like truly, truly understand how much I have been forgiven. And I want to let that dictate how I love him. I don't want to love him out of a place of like what I feel because it'll never be enough. And maybe it'll never be enough anyways, even if I do understand. But at least I'd be getting a heck of a lot closer. So tonight I'm, I'm going to wrap up here. Um, I would just invite you as we close here, like this, the little bit of time that we have have left here tonight, um, that you would let the, the weight of what he has done, the weight of the, the, the saving, the weight of the sin that you have that he's wiped clean, that you would let the weight of that influence how you worship him how you pour yourself out to him and dude if it's down here in the front with tears I'm, I'll be right next to you because that's what he deserves he deserves our tears and our ointment and our kiss and our wiping of the hair he deserves all of it there is nothing that we could possibly have that he doesn't deserve from us So, Father God, I just, I just pray tonight, Lord, that everybody in this room, Lord, that you would just be moving the way that you've been moving in me the last couple days, Lord. The way that you're still moving in me. 
God, that you would give us the heart of Mary, that you would give us the understanding that Mary had in this moment. God, that you would show us, like, what is it that we, we don't grasp yet? What is it that we don't get? God, show us, reveal to us, Lord, what we don't understand about you yet. Lord, just give us the the weight of what you've done, Lord. Let us just feel it so that we might know how much you deserve to be worshipped, Lord. Jesus, we just love you, Lord. We love you, we love you, we love you. I just pray that tonight is honoring of you. If there's anything that we have left, Lord, I pray that we would be able to pour it out on you. Thank you, Jesus. You are so good. In Jesus' name.